here it is again from a distance. So we're just marching away from water. And then when it's time for the, they're just on the last graze of that set. So the next day we'll come down here close to water and we'll graze away like that. Again, some more fence line. It looks like fences there, there isn't. The water in this point would be on the back side of this rocky reef. That's my dad, he loves coming and check things out. He loves this stuff. Go ahead. Are you rolling up that wire and pulling the post to know if that's gone or they just notice it's gone? Sometimes they just notice it, it's gone. Sometimes they, they're they excited about it and they're sitting there waiting. Other times they, um, they don't know about it, you know, and then they come and find it and then they buck and kick and they're excited. <laughs> Have a great time. Here's some more photos so you can see Kind of how how it works. Water would be way over here, and here's the here's the mob. And so what we've seen with monitoring in five years, um, and again this is in the driest decade in the history of the ranch. We have 27, 28 transects on the ranch, and um, quite I think I can't remember. Quite a few of those are in our winter zone. And in our winter zone, our, on average, we had 8% bare soil. And in five years, it went to 0%. And our most drastic example was 26% bare soil that went to 2% in five years. And that's not, we weren't feeding on, the, on that ground at all. That was not outside organic matter brought in. That was all grazing native stockpile range. And then um, we used third party auditor third party company to come in and read all these range monitoring transacts and last year they wanted to do some soil and haney some haney soil health tests on the ranch and so we did it in our winter zone and they continue to do that through a uh, uh, couple dozen ranches across the west I believe and our average organic matter percentage this was really exciting because it's the first time we've actually looked underneath the hood of what was happening. All the other feedback was all positive, but this was the first time we did a soil health test. And our average organic matter percentage on native range was 10.5%. We ranged from 8% 8, 8 to 16.5%. So this was on four transects. Um, the next highest of all the other ranches that they tested across the, the west, I believe, was under 4%. Um, and then soil respiration rate, which is, I believe, a, a metric to see how much microbial life there is in the soil, how much they're respiring. Um, ours was, on average, 174 parts per million. And then the next highest of those ranches was, they said, well under 100. So that was really neat. And then NRCS just did a soil health test on us this last summer. Um, and our neighbor who does continuous grazing, so they did us and then our neighbor, um, and we were at about 11.5% at that, at that site, organic matter percentage. And here's just a good visual of how that happens. You can see the amount of armor that's been trampled down on the soil surface. That's the power that we're talking about here. And so when we, when I did that experiment that I shared with you guys, that one day experiment on the right and then two and a half day graze on the left, and Mother Nature told us that that's the treatment that she needed, that dark, deep, green, rich, vibrant, rough fescue plants. And then I also understood from a numbers standpoint what that meant, and I knew that non-selective grazing was how, what we had to do. When we started doing that, and I knew that that type of grazing was what we had to do, it became glaringly obvious that our grazing management had outpaced our genetics. And so then I became intensely focused on genetics and became a total, um, my cousin accuses me of being a beef geek. Hey, um, that our, we didn't have the right type of cow to graze non-selectively without supplementing. This was before we found that very important tidbit of moving when the cows are full. 
Um, so it became very hyper-focused on genetics and the power of genetics and, and breeding for, selecting for the type of cow to graze this way that we needed to graze. <clears throat> so these are some home-raised bulls in the front. We started raising our own bulls. And so what we did, we've got a two-pronged approach. Well, before I dive into that, Johann Zeitzman, who I've once listed before, he says a cow has two main roles. One is to improve the ground that she's grazing. That's part of her job. And two is to efficiently convert grass into beef. And if you understand how hard it is to do both of those, you know it takes a special type of cow to do that and not break the bank. And so we started selecting our own bulls. And we've got a two-pronged approach. First, we'll go out to our mob. And we'll ride through. This is in the first cycle of calving. And we'll find the cows that you just want to put on a calendar. Body condition six, sleek hair coat, good bag, good feet, good mothering instinct. I don't care what the calf looks like. If it's a bull, we stick, we rope it, and we stick a tag in its ear, and it does not get cut at branding. Believe it or not, this is a 12-year-old cow, and that sucker grew up to be a stud. So these, this is, these are the genetics we're trying to capture. Not only is it, do they work in our environment, but they work under our management. The second pronged approach, which has actually been our biggest success, and I think where the real future of Seed and Livestock stands for us in our genetic program is what I call the elite of the elite. And so we've got our calving first calf heifers. They're two years old, they have their first calf. They start calving the end of May. Our bull battery goes in August 17th. But what we do is we take bulls and we dump them in the end of June. And they'll be in for the month of July and we pull in the month of July. What happens is that the most fertile girls in that peer group breed to those bulls. They are the elite of that peer group. And then they calve the next April those calves stay intact and they become our bulls. So we're capturing our most fertile genetics, again, under our management. And then we, we cast them out over the rest of the herd. And we start that snowball effect. The first year we did this, we had 4% um, take, and then it was 15%, and then 25%, and then we've been at 36% ever since. Is that just in your head? Yes, just in our heifers. Because we're a commercial outfit, we don't keep any records. That's only that's the only class of critters that I know that that as a heifer she bred first successfully, carried a calf successfully, calved, recycled, reconceived in a freakish amount of time, and then again successfully carried a pregnancy throughout the rest of the throughout the winter under our management. She, we, we want those genetics. Maybe I'm, maybe I didn't hear you quite right. She reconceived in a freakish amount of time. This was to breed back to have her second calf. Is that what you're just talking? Yeah. About? Okay. Can you say those dates again? So we calve. Let's say they're calving May 28th. May 30th is her due date. They start calving end of May. We'll drop bulls in June 25th. We pull them Ju July 25th. And then the normal bull battery doesn't go out until August 17th. Are you over bulling? Or just no. normal? Nor uh, not even normal. We'll drop, so there'll be 400 head of first calf heifers, and we'll drop in four bulls. And they're the best bulls, they're studs. So we wouldn't be able to pick, pick out these girls that that end up calving in April. But the bulls do. We pick, and, and then we pick the bulls that we think are the best based off of our metrics. And they go out, and what I mean by metrics, so we have these bull calves, we run them with our, our steers over the winter, so it's the same program. We wanna see how they do over the winter. Once they're 11 or 12 months old, we take them in, we get indiv individual hip heights, individual weights, and we measure and scrotals and measure their disposition and all that. But individual hip height to individual weight is the real 
metric that we're looking for. That measures the amount, how many pounds per vertical inch. Like what's their, what's their meat to bone ratio, what's their package? That has a high correlation with early sexual maturity, body condition, range functionality. And um, when I do buy outside bulls, that's one metric that I look for and it's the biggest indicator for how that bull's gonna grow out. This right here is a yearling, uh, yearling bull home raised. Um, and so not only are we doing that, well, we started doing that and it, it's gotten a lot of attention. This was never the intent. It's become an enterprise. We're selling bulls now. Um, and so the, here's some bulls that we sold to a, a buddy rancher of mine. But not only are we doing that, I'm also a big fan of composites. And it's crazy to me that not more people are raising composites. And the reason is, the science has been out since the 1980s. It came out of the Meat Animal Research Center. <clears throat> what happened, the power of composites, so heterosis effect is hybrid bigger. When you take a black Angus, cow and a Hereford cow and you cr or black Angus and a Hereford and you cross them and you get a black baldy calf that's 100% heterosis effect. That's why everyone loves black baldies. So what happens with heterosis effect is everything that every characteristic and trait that you value increases. Milking ability, doability on grass, longevity, fertility, body condition, disease resistance, weaning weights, everything goes up. But the difficulty in doing that is when you have a black baldy calf and then she grows up, becomes a cow and has a calf, her calf only has 50% heterosis effect. It gets diluted by half with each consecutive generation. The power in composites, if you have a true composite, which is five or more breeds under one hide, it captures an 83 to 88% heterosis effect that does not get diluted from one generation to the next. That's free money. And not only that, you're then able to mix and match breeds to take different qualities of different breeds to try and develop a cow that's best fit for your environment. Does that make sense? And so, we've been running black composite bulls since 2006, I believe. And we went all in in 2014 and not only that, we're now developing our own composite. And so phase one, I broke this out into different phases. This is how I think about it. I breed, and we already had a composite herd because we've been using black composite bulls since 2006 or eight. So we brought in an outside breed. I basically mapped out on paper a balance sheet of all of our, our cow herd strengths and their weaknesses. And I found a breed that, it, that addressed all of the weaknesses on that balance sheet. And it's this breed called Obrock, which is from, it's this region in South Central France, very high altitude, cold climate, they can't grow grains, so these cows have been selected for their doability off of grass for centuries. It's a continental breed, which is a strong outcross to the, to the composite that we currently have, which was mostly British, um, and a smaller frame, highly fertile, high meat to bone ratio, good, good mothering instinct. Um, and then phase two was we stack composites on top of composites, and this is where the science gets even crazier. The more breeds that you have inside of a composite, the tighter the bell curve for genetic expression. Meaning, when you have a, your calf crop becomes more uniform the more breeds you have inside of that composite. And they, what they showed with this science at, that came out of Meat Animal Research Center is that a composite will have a more uniform calf crop than a purebred herd, which is counterintuitive. But really, if you think about it, there's a natural law at play here. What happens when you increase biodiversity? Your resiliency goes up, your productivity goes up, your variation goes down. And that's, I believe, what we're seeing here with these composites. <clears throat> and so phase two, we're stacking composites on top of composites. You tighten that variability curve. And in phase three, we bring in another outside breed. We do an experiment with that. And then 
stack composites on top of composites, and then you can bring in another outside breed. So for our phase one, we brought in Obrock, which is this bull. Look at that dude. We, we bred to him and um, a few others like him. And this is a yearling half-blood Obrock. He's half, half Obrock, half composite. Um, he's in July breeding our, these are our first calf heifers in the background, and we got a bunch of quarter blood bulls out of them. And we did that for a number of years. The majority of our bull battery is quarter blood Obrock bulls. Yes? How, compared to like other, other bulls, you just, other breeds of bulls you've seen, how's the temperament on these composites? Are they, uh, do they seem to go out and cover cows pretty willingly instead of palling around with their buddies? Are they more aggressive or more easy to work? What would you say, how they compete with others? Um, they're breeding machines. That's good. Yeah, absolute <laughs> breeding machines. They, is there, and as far as the temperament, like, aside from the cows, are they still pretty pretty easy to work with? Or? So Obrocks are, I, I mean, composites, that, that'd be a blanket statement if I just said composites are, you know, this. Mm -hmm. What we've noticed with the semen composite that we've developed, been developing, um, vigor's gone up drastically. They are, like, they breed a lot of cows. And they're just highly functional. Obrock, as a breed, is known for kind of a, a touchier disposition, uh, which I like. We run in some rough country. We have wolves, grizzlies are moving into the area. Um, Black Angus, you know, the, the old, the old cowboy joke is a black Angus cow can't find her calf in a one horse trailer. And that's not very, that's not very functional. <laughs> the, these obrocks, when you show up in a pasture, they're watching. We've never had them try and take you. They're, they're just smarter. They're, they're paying attention. They know where their calf is all the time. And that's carried through, certainly. You can even tell how this guy's holding his head and looking at you. He's paying attention. Um, and I like that. Cooper, how many years after you started changing the breathing did, did you then decide you needed to change the genetics? Same year. It was oh. obvious. Oh. Yep. It was the same, same year. Hey, uh, folks, this is a beautiful conversation. I just wanted to, we might want to let him get through a slide or two every now and again. <laughs> you're well, how are we on time? If you're enjoying this, um, you can veto me at any point. I just want to respect the time you've spent into this presentation. It's already 12.07. So we've been talking an wow. hour and 10 minutes and got through about 10. Okay. okay. Just, We're just a thought. It's up to you. Good work, gang. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so half-blood, Obrock, half-blood, composite. We got a bunch of quarter-blood composite bulls out of them. We then put those quarter-bloods in early, and that became our phase two. Phase two. Different, sli different slide than I thought was coming up. This is a half-blood first calf heifer right here. Again, half-blood first calf heifer, body condition six. Wow. There are body condition sixes year-round. And it's the Dave, the cow boss, and I, every year we're just like, man, could you imagine if we had a whole herd of these? <laughs> It'd be crazy. What, what could we do? You know, I mean, there's a lot of room for human error, if that was the case, which is nice. You can breathe easy. You'd have more flexibility. You could wean later. You can push your cows harder and get more animal impact. I mean, it's, it, it'd be a game changer. Um, and then, so we took those quarter blood Obrock bulls, put them in early on our calving first calf heifers <laughs> as that prong two approach, and started the phase two where we're stacking composites on top of composites. This is a eight or nine month old bull calf, phase two. Um, we did that one year, and I've been really happy with the results. And what's really cool about this is that calf crop of the phase two, you could see that science play out where that variability curve tightens. Usually, out of our bull calves, there's, there's a range, and we end up calling out of 50 or 60, we'll call 10. Last year, I think we called one. They were cookie cutter. It was wild. And that's the only thing that changed. And then phase three, I'm thinking of bringing on these guys called Drakensberger, which is a breed from South Africa. 
uh, from the Drakensberg Mountains of South Africa. It's the only place that snows, aside from Kilimanjaro, I believe. Um, they're, they're black. They're, about mo they're moderate framed. They have, they're highly fertile, very good longevity, and it's about as big of an outcross as you can get. They don't even know what, um, what genus of cow, I mean, if I'm saying that right, they don't know if it's Bos indicus, Bos, it, it doesn't line up with anything that exists. They're their own specimen. Um, getting semen for these guys is really tough, but I'm determined. <laughs> um, so how to increase stocking rate through genetics? As I said, I'm a big believer of composites. I think that increases your genetic resiliency um, through the natural law that I was talking about. And um, not only are you capturing that heterosis, but that breed complementarity where you can mix and match the strengths and weaknesses of breeds to develop for a different cow. I think there's a real power there. In fact, Johann Zeitzman says that's the number one power of composites. Side benefit is a heterosis. Cow size, as Steve was mentioning, is huge. You know, it's what, a 1,400 pound cow versus a 1,000 pound cow. If you were to immediately take all your 1,400 pound cows and start running 1,000 pound cows, you can run 20% more. It takes a 1,000 pound cow seven and a half pounds of grass to raise one pound of calf. And a 1,400 pound cow, it takes them almost 10 pounds of grass to raise one pound of calf. So there's a lot of efficiencies here that can be gained. Um, and then selecting for func functional genetics, genetic resiliency. And for us in this model, body condition is everything. It's early sexual maturity, it's their longevity, it's their hormonal balance, and then that high relative intake, the genetic high relative intake that I was talking about. And then with our grazing management, we hope to compound that by moving them when they're bold and increasing their high relative intake. Um, this is a grass-fed steak out of our composite cows. And we pay attention to how these cows work throughout the entire chain. We want to make sure that not only are they working on the ground, we want to make sure that, that they're working on the other end as well. We've retained ownership on hundreds and hundreds of these composites, and um, the, the needle is moving in a positive direction on all fronts. And so I believe that when you marry functional genetics with non-selective grazing, with good on the ground observation, then it creates a win-win-win. You can grow more with less, and so increase your ecological production, which then increases your, your economic ability to generate revenue. And also it's exciting. People want to be a part of that. You're empowering people. This is our cow boss, Dave Ward. He says that he's changing the world one bite at a time. And one thing that we've been doing, which is pretty cool, um, I've gone around and given quite a few of these talks, and people are pretty amped up, but I don't think anyone really goes home and, and makes any changes. So we've had some winter grazing workshops at the ranch. This will be our fourth winter doing that, just to, just to empower people to pull the mystique out of it and empower people to go home and actually do this if you so choose and if you want to. There's full transparency. It's a, it's a field day out with the mob, nothing hidden. You see what we've been doing. You see where they're going. We talk about the, or a lot of what we talked about today. And then we talk about developing your eye for volume of grass, developing that feel for when it's time to move them, and then going through the math of how to calculate graze their paddock size and um, everything else there's been so that's been that's been fun and rewarding and um, people have certainly enjoyed that is there any more this year we've got one on february 23rd march 5th and march 21st and if you'd like to come just shoot me an email i'll get you signed up my email is just cooper at stevenlivestock.com. Cooper, was there a rain or snow event left of that pit? There was, yeah. It was a wet, this was an April, April workshop. It looks, it looks rough, but if you got out in it, it's really exciting. And it, that's part of the pasture where we're now getting an 840% increase of harvest 
rate over the historical average. Um, this was a neat day. There was about 50, Rebecca was there this day, there was about 50 government employees, state and federal, that came out to check out what we're doing with grazing. And to have that type of support and interest from agency personnel is really cool. <clears throat> Another thing that this allowed us to do was, is it really allowed us to sharpen our pencil and figure out what this grass meant to us and what, what economically, by increasing our grazing, what we'd be able to gain. And when I first came home, I said to Uncle Chase, I was like, man, it would be nice to have water up here. It's really hard to graze these cows well without water. Um, but it's going to cost about $80,000. And so I got laughed at, rightfully so, because it's just like, well, how the heck are we going to pay for that? We didn't, we didn't know what could be gained by changing our grazing management or what could be gained by having water in a certain area of the pasture. Now we do, and we've been doing serious water projects every year. So this is a, a 2D9s, ripping it in six feet deep, a four inch and a three inch pipe that delivers 75 gallons a minute in our winter zone, and we put in nine tanks. Um, it goes up to a mother tank up on top, and then gravity feeds to everything else. No valves, you can see these um, different stand pipes, those are all different outflows that then send water in whichever line you want. So you just, instead of having a valve, we pull, we pull the drain on whichever direction we want to send that water, and it's all gravity. Um, again, here's our two and three year olds. The reason they're able to graze like that is because we put a, a tank in. I've been work, working with a water witcher, and he witched a vein that uh, produces 35 to 85 gallons a minute, depending on the season, and it's all gravity, and we put in about five miles of pipe and eight tanks on this, this end of the hills over here, which had zero water. It opened up about 1,000, 1,200 acres. Um, <clears throat> there's one of the end tanks right there, and that system paid for itself in, 56% of that was paid for in three weeks. That's the power of water. When you're dealing at this magnitude, that's a pretty good ROI. Although I did just go to ranching for profit and they expect 100% <laughs> ROI in one year. It's crazy. Um, but it doesn't look like it, but there's 1,300 head up there. And that area of the ranch has only ever seen elk and mule deer. Now there's 1,300 cows on that. Think of what that's doing to the ground. It's pretty darn exciting. Here's a closer, doesn't look like 1,300 head, but they're all the way up top. What's pretty interesting is um, most people, grip, our most intensive grazing happens in the winter because of what I talked about. That's where a choke point is. Um, we're out there checking the cows every day. We'd rather be moving poly wire than getting in a tractor. And um, whereas most people, their intensive grazing happens during the growing season or sometime in the summer. It's kind of the exact opposite for us. In the summer, we will still be moving sometimes two, three days. Sometimes our average graze period for the mob is probably five to seven days. Um, and then we've got four service permits where we're grazing, you know, we're moving once every five or six weeks. So we cover the whole gamut. But, um, what we found through this non-selective grazing in the winter is we, we've certainly increased our resiliency on all fronts. So our, our people are excited about what, what we're doing. They're glad to be a part of it. Um, they feel like they're, they're making a difference, and they are. Um, what we're doing with building soil and increasing our ecologic resiliency. Um, it's really gonna make a difference, I think. And it's a way to keep it in the family. This is pretty cool, this is my Uncle Whit. And um, we started a ranch camp, because uh, the sixth generation lives all over the state, and, we're, and the conversation within the family is how do we how do we ensure that there's a spiritual, a sacred spiritual connection to this place to where they value it more than anything? 
and yet these kids aren't growing up here. How do you do that? And so we started a ranch camp where the sixth generation comes out and spends a week at the ranch and they learn to go and, and pick plants and then make dyes out of those plants. They learn how to gut fish. They learn how to make shelters. They learn how to start fires. And here's um, Uncle Witt teaching them how to cook steaks. He's a he's an old mountain man. He'd, he'd go to all those mountain man rendezvous. And so here's steaks that are slapped up against the side of these rocks. And um, when they're medium, he, he's like, watch this. When they're medium rare, they'll fall into the fire. <laughs> and uh, and then meanwhile, Uncle Chase, who's a real um, barbecue freak, he's over here in the corner um, barbecuing up steaks. And uh, these ones were way better, and they're cooked perfectly. <laughs> they were perfectly medium rare when they fell into the fire. And then here's me and Posey. And anyway, I think that's how we can advance it forward into the into the future. And why why it's worth it. So, I think we have five minutes for questions. Ten minutes. Nine. Right here. So those water that you have, you said they're gravity fed so that you can chop the water, and if that's the case, what is your rate for buying water for each house and water, or how do you buy it? So on the gravity fed, it's constantly flowing. So no, no ice needed to be chopped. That one in the winter zone that was eighty thousand dollar project, that is a pump that goes up to um, the highest tank and then it's gravity from then on out. But that is, and last year, uh, we've got a timer on it. Last year was the first year that we used it. I wasn't ever bold enough to put the timer on because how brutal the winter was. Um, so it's a, I think that ended up being $750 a month in electricity. So nothing to sneeze at, but what it's done for us on grass, then yeah, you can sneeze at it. Yeah. Yes. I guess I got two questions. One, with your genetics and your grass, do you think you're ever going to plateau? And then my other question is, you're here 20 years from now and giving this talk, how different do you think it's going to be? Ooh, those are good, good questions. So whether or not there's a ceiling with our genetics and our grass, and if I'm here 20 years from now, whether or not, how different the talk is going to be? How, how different is your understanding? Oh, I, how different is my understanding of this stuff? Um, so on the first part, you know, I, I think that's what's so exciting. No, no one knows where the ceiling is. Or it, I haven't talked to anybody who's doing um, regenerative agriculture successfully where they found where they've plateaued. There's got to there's got to be a ceiling at some point. Um, but we're kind of, it's like a, it's a frontier. We don't know where that is. And I'm, I'm sure from a grass standpoint, there's gotta be a place where we plateau. Genetics, I hope not. Um, and I also hope 20 years from now, if I am giving this talk, that I have an entirely different understanding of it. And that means I've done my job. There, there was a, a slide up there I meant to mention. Um, the 2021 and 2022 winters where we gained body condition and everything was great. You notice, I meant to point out, there's a reason 2023 wasn't listed on there. So after those two years of, of um, increasing our, our herd size and, and you know, increasing body condition through the winter without supplement, we're pretty, we're pretty confident, even cocky. And um, Mother, Na Mother Nature makes damn sure to humble you when that happens. And we were very humbled last year. So what happened last year was we had um, at that lower elevation just just horrid growing conditions. So we didn't have much organic matter. And then in the fall, we had really good rains. And we had about 10 inches of green grass, which we were really excited about. But we didn't know that that what ended up happening was that ratio of old feed to green feed was way out of whack. And it was like we we're doing early green up grazing throughout the entire winter. So our cows were never full. They were, their behavior, they were never content because they were never full. Um, we couldn't make them happy. It was, it was just really, really hard. 
um, and we were not able to, at best, we maintained condition. Could you have done differently? Maybe feed straw, but that logistically is really challenging. Yes. You probably said it, but I didn't catch it. What's the furthest distance from the drinkers that you go as you're working away from that water? Good question. So, is um, what's the furthest the drinkers? The tanks are when we're working away from them. We'll, we've gone as far as two miles, which is way too far. I don't. I'm not recommending that. It's just it's possible your cows will lose condition if you're doing that. Uh, what we've noticed is once you hit two-thirds of a mile, it gets more difficult. So uh, how many moves, I know it's there, but like how many moves away from that water does it work out usually to get to that two-thirds of a mile? Oh, it depends on how dense that feed is. And usually we're in like seven, seven to ten day set, sets. That answers your question. Yes, in the back. Yeah, I was wondering with transitioning away from feeding hay and as you've been progressing in this winter grazing, have you seen a change in like mineral consumption with the cows or, or, or any of their like? You know, mineral con consumption is still pretty variable. You know, it, it depends on how wet the feed is. Their salt in intake will go up if they're consuming a lot more water than they otherwise would. That's what we've noticed. After storms, they'll get hungry for mineral, and then sometimes they won't. It, um, but one thing that we have noticed, you know, if we have to feed our cows for four to seven days in a row, like this last cold snap, the mom was on feed for four days. <clears throat> sometimes they get into this depressed mentality and they're just waiting for the feed, feed wagon when it's time to go back out to grazing. And so what we do to snap them out of that mindset is we will make them hungry. So not move them when they're full. We'll make them hungry to wake that part, wake that competitive spirit up in them again, that competitive mobbing behavior. And then we'll move them multiple times a day. And every time we're making them a little hungry and we'll move them multiple times a day to just to to develop and cultivate that drive and that want and that desire to, to be, to, to go and get that bite of grass before that other cow does. So that we, again, that competitive instinct is a tool that you can use how to leverage or learn how to leverage um, creatively. Bill. Uh, Cooper, I, I know you've got a lot of Yeah, so um, the, what's been really frustrating for me is uh, when we embarked on this new model, it's like all of a sudden the science didn't seem to fit, all the science that's been done, and we're trying to figure out how to make this all work. Um, and once we moved our calving date, calving was a breeze, it's awesome, you're calving on green grass, you show up and there's hundreds of calves on the ground. but getting those cows to rebreed has been really, really difficult. And we, every single year, we thought we were hitting it out of the park, and then come preg test time, it was always a depressing series of days. And there was one year we started to supplement with this uh, Urea Biuret product, and uh, a lot of bowling activity, we thought for sure we are gonna be, our, our goal was to be 90% above. And we thought for sure we we're going to be in the 90s. And sure enough, we we're still in the 80s. And it was, I just felt like I was hitting my head off the wall. And so what we've been having, we had an NRCS agent, Rick Coughlin, um, come out every month for 10 years. At this point, it had been 10 years doing nutball samples, which is, stands for nutritional balance, where they take clinical samples and they send them into a lab in Texas to test how much protein and energy is in their feed at that time. Um, but a part of that is uh, Rick had to body condition score these cows. 
And so after I felt completely defeated after this year of preg testing, I pulled all that data from the 10 years of, of nutball samples. And from May through October, for 10 years, I mapped out what the crude protein was and what their body condition was, and then the corresponding breed up, just to see if there's any pattern, any rhyme or reason, because it, we couldn't see the forest for the trees at that point. We we're just so deep in it, there was no rhyme or reason. And so back to the science and our model, science says that the number one indicator for or for breed back or is body condition at time of calving. If they're body condition five at time of calving, your breed up's gonna be good. Well, we're body condition five at time of calving every single year, and that wasn't true for us. But what was true is if we're body condition six at time of calving, according to these graphs that I made out, they can be a constant body condition slide all the way through the rest of the season and still breed up in the 90s. So they had enough fat reserves to make that happen. And if that wasn't the case, then if they had a if their body condition maintained or gained in the month of in the month before bowl turnout, didn't matter what their body condition was. If it maintained or gained, then they would breed back in the 90s. But if they didn't, then you'd be in the 80s. And so because that was a huge light bulb moment for me because we needed a rule of thumb for management to be able to decide if and when we actually supplement. And so that's we started supplementing um, three weeks prior to bulls going out with a high energy supplement. Um, and I think there's a difference there too. In a lot of the low input circles, there's, there's an emphasis on, on protein being the limiting factor. But really all that science, th this is my takeaway, I don't know how true this is, but all that science has been done on warm season grasses, which have an extra carbon molecule which is more energy. So then your limiting factor is protein. Our limiting factor, cool season grasses have three carbon molecules. Our limiting factor is energy. And so we started, that first year I didn't understand that. We started supplementing with a protein supplement. It didn't move the needle. Next year I talked to a nutritionist about it and he's like, yeah, you guys are energy deficient is why. You have all the protein you need, it's energy. And so we supplemented with a high energy block and like that, our breed up moved 10 points in one year. Just a quick follow up with all the work you talked about with genetics. Do you think that is a I sure hope so. That's, that's a big part of the point. And it, it, it seems to, so this phase two, what's really encouraging these phase two, phase two um, yearling heifers, they bred up at 100%, which we've never had happen. And we, you know, we don't, so that's pretty cool. That's encouraging. Is it a fluke? Maybe. So. Sorry, I've got Thank to you. cut it off. We're already over time. And there's a sit-down lunch for everyone over in the main room um, that started three 